inspired a new generation of Canadian artists and talent. Thank you. Oral questions, question oral, honorable leader. The honorable leader of the official opposition. For 10 years, the authoritarian government in Beijing has been trying to intervene to help this prime minister politically, beginning with a donation of $200,000 to the Trudeau Foundation. Since then, our intelligence services have informed the prime minister that this government interfered in two elections to support the Liberal Party and the Prime Minister did absolutely nothing about it. Will he finally allow a public inquiry, an independent inquiry, so that Canadians find out the truth? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. President. Mr. Speaker, it will be no surprise to you that I don't agree with the Leader of the Opposition. He falsely claims that this government has done nothing. We took action as soon as we took office, Mr. Speaker, to counter foreign interference in our elections. In fact, we were the only government to have done so, as my friend opposite, when he was minister responsible for democratic institutions, he did nothing. He did nothing when intelligence services raised this question over 10 years ago. We didn't have to because the dictatorship, the communist dictatorship in Beijing was not helping the Conservative Party get elected. Contrary to that, for 10 years, the communist dictatorship in Beijing has been helping the Prime Minister. They gave $200,000 in donations to the Trudeau Foundation. They interfere, interfered in two successive elections to help the Liberals win. And the Prime Minister knew about it after numerous briefings to that effect. He's done absolutely nothing to stop it because he benefits from it. Will he finally al allow a public and truly independent investigation of it? Thank you. The Honourable Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs. We take the issue of foreign interference in Canada's electoral system and any foreign interference very seriously. Mr. Speaker, that's why when we formed government, we took a number of unprecedented steps that did not exist when my friend was a minister in the previous government. We created the National Security and Intelligence Committee of Parliamentarians, precisely so. Parliamentarians from all political parties could have access to classified information and publish reports for Canadians. We set up an independent panel of senior public servants, Mr. Speaker, to follow exactly the issue of foreign interference in the elections, and we'll continue to do more. Here, here. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Well, all they've done is had the former CEO of the China-financed Trudeau Foundation to write a report about it, in which he unsurprisingly says, don't worry, be happy. And we know why the Liberals want to cover this up. They benefited from Beijing's interference in two successive elections. The question is, why isn't the NDP actually doing its job? Yeah. They've been working against transparency and preventing top liberal campaign operatives and PML officials from testifying in committee. Why won't the NDB stop its cover-up coalition and allow top-level officials to testify and answer questions? The Honourable Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs. Mr. Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition wants top-level officials to testify public, uh, publicly before parliamentary committees. The good news is that's exactly what they did last week, Mr. Speaker. The heads of our intelligence agencies, the Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs, the National Security and Intelligence Advisor to the Prime Minister. I know my friend will be very excited to know that I'm going to the Procedures Committee myself on Thursday and be happy to answer any questions, Mr. Speaker. From the beginning, we have said that we take this issue very seriously. We've put in place unprecedented steps to deal with foreign interference and will continue to do more. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Well, we learned that the Prime Minister now has a big announcement to make at 5 p.m. today. This after 10 years of having known that Beijing was interfering to support him with donations to the Trudeau Foundation and help in numerous federal election campaigns, now he's announcing something. And we know that he's probably going to try to sweep this under the rug by naming a liberal establishment insider to have a secretive process that will never bring about the truth. 
What we don't know for sure is whether the NDP is once again going to be a co-conspirator in making that happen. Will we have a final and clear public investigation so Canadians know the truth? The Honourable Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs. Mr. Speaker, uh, the Leader of the Opposition was Minister responsible for democratic reform in the previous Conservative government. In 2013, CSIS identified foreign interference as a challenge in the electoral context. Uh, Mr. Harper's former National Security Advisor raised this publicly in 2010, 13 years ago, Mr. Speaker. And when my honourable friend was a minister responsible for this very file, he did absolutely Zero. nothing Zero. to deal with the question yep. of foreign interference. I know he's frustrated that we've done so much. And the good news, Mr. Speaker, is we'll continue to do more because we take this issue very seriously. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Across the floor and let me know that the Trudeau Foundation had received $200,000 from Beijing. Let me know that the uh, dictatorship in Beijing was planning to interfere in successive elections to help Liberals get elected. If they had been transparent about that back then, we wouldn't be having this conversation now. Instead, we've had 10 years of cover-ups from this Prime Minister, who's benefited from the interference, known about it, been briefed on it, done nothing except try to sleep, sweep it under the rug. Will the NDP stop covering up for the Liberals and get top PMO and Liberal Party officials to answer questions before our committee. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, just because the Leader of the Opposition keeps insisting on a falsehood doesn't make it real. He knows very well, Mr. Speaker, that our government took unprecedented Absolutely. steps to deal with this issue because we take it seriously. A panel of senior public servants, chaired by the Clerk of the Privy Council, setting up in law the National Security and Intelligence Committee yep. of Parliamentarians, including representatives, Mr. Speaker, from all political parties. We have taken this issue seriously. We have made senior officials available at parliamentary committees, and we'll continue to do everything we can to strengthen Canadian democratic institutions. Here, here. The Honourable Member for La Prairie. Mr. Speaker, the Globe and Mail's revelations about Chinese interference are cause for concern. Whether the outcome of the last election would have been different isn't the question. When the integrity of the electoral process is threatened, it's the responsibility of all of us here in this House to stand up for it. It's the public confidence in our democratic system that's at stake here. This goes well beyond partisan issues. Will the Prime Minister call an independent public inquiry into foreign interference in our elections? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I agree with my Honourable Colleague that this issue should be nonpartisan in the sense that we all have a shared interest in strengthening and defending our democratic institutions. Our government has taken a number of steps, strong steps, that have been evaluated by independent experts uh, follow the last, following the last election. But, Mr. Speaker, we are always looking for new steps we can take, hopefully with the support of all members here, to strengthen our democratic system. The Honourable Member for La Prairie. Well, speaking of experts, Jean-Pierre Kingsley, the former chief uh, electoral officer, Gerald Butts, the PM's former advisor, and even Morris Rosenberg all agree that we need an inquiry into the integrity of our elections. No matter how hard you think about it, we can't imagine who would be against shedding light on any threat to the functioning of our democratic system. We can't afford to have doubts about the legitimacy of any single member here in this House, Mr. Speaker, we really don't want that. What's it going to take for this government to set up a commission of inquiry that's public and independent into foreign interference in our elections? The Honourable Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs. Mr. Speaker, I think our government has shown a great deal of transparency in our efforts to counter foreign interference in our elections and our democratic system. We're looking forward to working with all members, both here and in the other place, and that is precisely why we set up the National Committee of Parliamentarians, who are tasked specifically with 
examining this type of question and reporting to Canadians. We've created monitoring agencies to make sure that our democratic institutions are protected, but we are still looking for other solutions while we're at it. Canadians are very troubled with the allegations of foreign interference in our elections, but the Prime Minister doesn't seem concerned at all. The former head of CSIS, the former head of Elections Canada, and even Morris Rosenberg, who wrote the 2021 Federal Election Report, are all encouraging the Prime Minister to go forward with a national public inquiry on foreign interference. The PROC Committee of the House of Commons has even adopted an NDP motion that this House vote may vote on soon, calling for a public inquiry as well. So why is the Prime Minister so opposed? Why is he refusing to get answers for Canadians? The Honourable Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs. Mr. Speaker, our government is, uh, is taking the issue of foreign interference in Canada's democratic institutions very seriously. As my colleague heard, our government has taken unprecedented steps since we formed the government in 2015 to put in place a series of measures precisely to provide greater transparency and understanding to Canadians on a threat, Mr. Speaker, that has existed for well more than 13 years and which has been publicly discussed for over a decade. The good news, Mr. Speaker, is our government takes it seriously, and the good news is the 2019 and 2021 elections were decided freely and fairly by Canadians. The Honourable Member for Rosemont La Petite Patrie. Mr. Speaker, in a democratic society, few things are more critical than the integrity of the election process and trust in institutions. There are serious allegations of interference, and it's this Prime Minister's responsibility to launch a public inquiry to get to the bottom of it. People deserve transparency. The former head of CSIS and Elections Canada, former senior public servant Morris Rosenberg, and a House of Commons committee are pushing for a public inquiry. So why is the Prime Minister saying no? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I agree with my Honourable Colleague that confidence in our institutions, public institutions and public confidence are important. We've taken these allegations very seriously from the moment we took office. We took a number of steps, including legislative steps to ensure that our democratic institutions are protected from foreign interference. It's unacceptable, and as my colleague knows full well, we share his concern. And the good news is, Mr. Speaker, we are going to continue to do what's necessary. We found out that CSIS uncovered a plan to influence the Prime Minister with a $200,000 donation to the Trudeau Foundation from agents of the communist regime in Beijing. The response? blame CSIS. Another page out of the playbook of divide, distract, deflect and deny while, our, while the confidence in our democracy hits an all-time low. The Prime Minister needs to end the cover-up and come clean with Canadians about what he knew and when he knew it. The Prime Minister refuses. What's he hiding? Yeah. The Honourable Minister of Justice. Public safety. Speaker, as my Honourable Colleague, the Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs has said, we take the threat of foreign interference, interference very seriously, which is why we have taken concrete action, like putting in place threat reduction measures for CSIS, like cracking down on foreign funding, which could interfere with our domestic elections, Mr. Speaker, but with the corresponding transparency through the creation of bodies like the National Security and Intelligence Committee of Parliamentarians to ensure that we're upfront with Canadians, Mr. Speaker. All members should be united in protecting our elections. They are sacrosanct. Canadians and Canadians alone determine them. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Thornhill. Mr. Speaker, the allegations of foreign interference are serious, and they deserve a serious response from a serious Prime Minister. They need to be investigated, and they need to be investigated by a credible, nonpartisan, and independent body. They need to be investigated by Parliament, not by Liberal insiders. With the help of the NDP, the Prime Minister is refusing to send his Chief of Staff to committee. So I'll ask again, what is he hiding? Yeah. The Honourable Minister of Public Safety. This government, under the leadership of this Prime Minister, that created the National Security and Intelligence Committee of Parliamentarians, 
to encourage and foster collaboration across partisan lines because this is an issue that transcends that dynamic, Mr. Speaker. We will continue to shine a light on the threats that are posed by foreign interference so that we can protect our democratic institutions, especially elections, because Canadians and Canadians alone must be reassured that they determine their elections and no one else. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Wellington, Halton Hills. Mr. Speaker, for years, CSIS has tracked Beijing's foreign interference and has said that, quote, foreign interference is a serious threat to the security of Canada, end quote. For years, CSIS has advised the Prime Minister that, quote, Canada can make use of a policy that is grounded in transparency and sunlight in order to highlight the point that foreign interference should be exposed to the public, end quote. So will the Prime Minister heed this advice, be transparent, and let PMO officials testify before a parliamentary committee? Yeah. Yeah. The Honourable Minister of Public Safety. My colleague's question, and I also embrace uh, his concerns around transparency. And this is a government that has raised the bar of transparency through the creation of NCCOP, through the creation of the National Security Intelligence Review Agency, which both have robust access to classified information so that we can be upfront with Canadians in the ways in which we are protecting all of our institutions, especially elections. And Mr. Speaker, as my colleague, the Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs, said, good news. Two independent, independent panels have concluded that both of the elections in 2019 and 2021 are free and fair, and we will continue this work together. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Wellington, Halton Hills. Mr. Speaker, they concluded overall they were free and fair. Mr. Speaker, last election, the G7 Rapid Response Mechanism in Global Affairs Canada tracked Chinese Communist Party interference targeting candidates like Kenny Chu. But despite Global Affairs tracking interference in real time during the election, nothing was done. Kenny Chu was not informed. Clearly, the critical election incident protocol did not work. Since the PMO had a hand in setting up this protocol, Will the PMO let PMO officials testify in front of a committee in order to tell us why the protocol was set up the way it was? Yeah. The Honourable Minister of Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, as my colleague knows, this government set up the site panel and the critical incident reporting protocol to ensure that independent, nonpartisan, professional public servants would make decisions about which allegations of foreign interference would be disclosed, Mr. Speaker. That is a process that has served our democracy well, and now we will take the recommendations from Morris Rosenberg, work closely with the public service to implement them so that we can build on the strong track record of this government, which remains vigilant and clear-eyed about fighting against the threats of foreign interference. The Honourable Member for Mégantic-Lérable. Mr. Speaker, the Liberal Prime Minister denied the allegations of foreign interference in our elections by the Communist regime in Beijing. He thought that by sweeping it under the rug, people would forget about it. But no, there have been lots of revelations in the news, and there's no end. We're learning new things each and every day about Beijing's foreign interference in our elections. While the Prime Minister turns a blind eye, the Trudeau Foundation refunded $200,000 to a Chinese businessman. Why does the Prime Minister refuse to call a public inquiry into Beijing's interference in our elections? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, our government, as my colleague put it so well. We take the question seriously, and we have been taking it seriously ever since we took office. He claims that we've uh, turned a blind eye, but that's not true. And he knows that full well, because if his government had taken the threat seriously, because the threat was around, has been around for over 10 years, they would have taken strong steps like we did specifically to counter this unacceptable interference. And we will continue to do everything that needs to be done to strengthen our institutions. The Honourable Member, he wants to go back to 2013. OK, let's go back to a group, a business group uh, for liberal financing, liberal funding. And one of the questions was, uh, the Prime Minister answered, I have some admiration for China because the system has allowed them to transform their economy overnight. 
That's the Liberal Party's view of things. The Beijing regime took sophisticated steps to disrupt our elections in 2021, and that's what the Globe and Mail reported. Why are they dismissing uh, Katie Tilford as a witness at committee, Mr. Speaker, the Honourable Minister? Mr. Speaker, my colleague harkened back to 2013. I think that is when CSIS had identified the threat uh, of Chinese interference potentially in our, in our elections. And who was the minister in 2013? Who was responsible for the integrity of democratic institutions? It was the current leader of the opposition. And in 2013, Mr. Speaker, he did nothing. In 2014, he did nothing. And he did nothing in 2015 either. The Honourable Member for Trois-Rivières. Mr. Speaker, it's one way or the other. Either there was interference by the Chinese authorities in our electoral system and everything must be done to put an end to it, or there was no interference and a Commissioner McCray will help restore public confidence in our system. Either way, it's the best thing to do. It's the only thing to do to ensure maintaining public trust in our institutions. So what's it going to take for this government to set up a public and independent Commission of Inquiry? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, as I said uh, a few minutes ago, since we, as soon as we took office, we acknowledged the threat of possible foreign interference in our elections and with our democratic institutions, and that's why we amended the Elections Act when it came to foreign contributions to our election campaigns, and that is why, through legislation, we, we created a bill that struck a committee responsible, a watchdog committee, with representation from all parties, including the bloc, and we referred those important questions to those members of that committee. The Honourable Member for Trois-Rivières. Mr. Speaker, let's get serious. The Prime Minister must be aware of the very bad signal he's sending by refusing to call for an inquiry. What's he trying to hide? Who is he trying to protect? Who's involved and how? That's not the kind of message that he should be sending. The message should be, we will never let anyone interfere in our electoral system, and we'll do everything in our power to prevent foreign interference. Mr. Speaker, in order to do that, it takes a public and independent commission, commission of inquiry. Will they set up a public and independent commission of inquiry? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I agree with my honourable colleague. We need to work together and do everything that needs to be done to protect Canada's elections and democratic institutions. The good news, Mr. Speaker, is that that's exactly what we've been doing ever since we took office. And also, Mr. Speaker, we are constantly looking for advice on ways to strengthen the already strong steps we've taken, and we will continue to do everything that needs to be done, precisely because we share the opinion of my honourable colleague that that interference is wholly unacceptable. The honourable member for Laurence Labelle. Mr. Speaker, the Procedure and House Affairs Committee passed a motion calling for a public and independent commission of inquiry into foreign interference in our elections. The committee also agreed with the Bloc's proposal that the inquiry chair should be agreed on by all parties in this House. Why? Because this has to go beyond partisanship. What matters is the integrity of our electoral system. Will the government accept the committee's request and set up a commission of inquiry into foreign interference into our elections? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I agree with my honourable colleague that we need to work together as parliamentarians precisely to counter the issue of foreign interference in our democratic institutions. My colleague knows full well because she's a member of the committee. I'm looking forward to seeing her when I myself will appear there on Thursday. We've been transparent with members, but we've also taken strong steps to counter foreign interference 
And those measures, those steps are working well. St. Albert Edmonton. Speaker, the Globe and Mail reported based upon a review of CSIS documents that Beijing launched an orchestrated machine to help the Liberals in the 2021 election. In the face of these alarming revelations, Canadians deserve answers from this Prime Minister. What they don't deserve is a Prime Minister who obstructs, deflects, and hides. If the Prime Minister has nothing to hide, will he let his Chief of Staff testify before a committee, or is he going to double down on his cover-up? The Honourable Minister of Public Safety. Has heard now on a number of occasions. We take these matters very, very seriously. We approach them very soberly, and that's why, Mr. Speaker, this is a government that has put in place the authorities that are required for CSIS to both address and mitigate against potential uh, foreign interference. Mr. Speaker, that is why we've also created the requisite transparency for Canadians, including through the creation of NCCOP, through the creation of NCIRA through the creation of the independent panels, both of which have examined the circumstances and the allegations around the 19 and 2021 elections. And yes, both of those elections were free and fair, but we'll continue to do this work together. A member for St. Albert Edmonton. Mr. Speaker, three times Conservatives tried to bring the Prime Minister's Chief of Staff to testify at committee. Three times the Liberals, with the support of the NDP, blocked that effort. This despite scandalous reports that senior PMO officials were briefed by CSIS about Beijing's interference and did nothing about it. Is the Prime Minister shielding his Chief of Staff because he knows his PMO turned a blind eye to Beijing's interference? The Honourable Minister of Public Safety. My colleague and the members of that parliamentary committee had the benefit of hearing extensive evidence from our government's most senior public servants who are implicated in the area of national security and intelligence, including the Prime Minister's national security advisor. Mr. Speaker, it's important for my colleague to remember that this is not a partisan issue. That's why we'll continue to be up front in that committee. That's why we'll continue to leverage the other agencies and bodies which were there to raise the bar of transparency and sunlight on the way in which we fight against foreign interference so that we can protect our democratic institutions. Thank you. Member for Dufferin Caledon. What are they trying to hide, Mr. Speaker? That's the question. It's pretty clear that this Beijing communist influence operation has been going on in Canada for a long period of time. We know that senior members of the PMO were briefed. All we're asking for is that they come and testify. They hide, they obfuscate, they won't deliver these people. Why? That's the question Canadians should be asking themselves. What are they hiding? Why won't they bring her to testify? The Honourable Minister of Public Safety. Every reasonable member in this chamber can look at the laws that we put into place, including the bodies and the agencies, and see readily that they contribute to being transparent and upfront with Canadians. Mr. Speaker, those are important institutions which are there so that we can explain to Canadians how it is that we are tackling this issue together. Mr. Speaker, the Parliamentary Committee has heard from evidence, uh, I beg your pardon, from witnesses. We're continuing to look for ways in which we can be transparent with Canadians so that we can undertake the work of fighting against foreign interference together to protect our democratic institutions. The Honourable Member for Victoria. Mr. Speaker, Canada's spy agency has warned us that climate crisis will threaten national security, critical infrastructure, and our food systems. But in the face of this clear and very real threat, we have the Conservatives who deny that we need to act, and the Liberals who keep delaying while handing out billions to big polluters. Oil and gas CEOs are laughing as they rake in record profits and scale down their climate commitments. The climate crisis threatens everything that we hold dear. When will this government force big polluters to clean up their act and stop making Canadians pay the price? Here, here. The Honourable Minister of Environment. Mr. Speaker, I thank my Honourable colleague for, for this question. Her question points exactly to the reason why, in the last year alone, we've presented the first ever emissions reduction plan for Canada, which shows a path how Canada will meet its 2030 targets. For the first time in history, we've put forward the National Adaptation Strategy, both 
which have been applauded by industry, non-governmental organization, and experts alike, and why we're investing $120 billion, Mr. Speaker, to fight climate change and support Canadians. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Well the Honourable Member for Cowich and Malahat Langford. Mr. Speaker, Canadians are really worried about keeping up with the high costs of their groceries, and the prices just keep on going up. While people are stretching their budgets to handle growing costs, rich corporations and grocery chains are making massive profits. Last week, the European Central Bank expressed concerns that CEOs are using the cost of living crisis and inflation to hike their prices, and the Bank of Canada is admitting to having the same fears. Will the Liberals finally admit rich CEOs and corporate greed are helping drive up food prices, and will they make them pay what they owe? The Honourable Associate Minister of Finance. Speaker, I thank the Honourable Member for his question, and we've been very clear on this. We have spoken with the CEOs of grocery companies in this country. We have referred the matter to the Competition Bureau. My colleague, the Minister of Innovation, Science and Economic Development, has been very clear in this matter. And, Mr. Speaker, when it comes to asking largest corporations to do their fair share, we have the Canada Dividend Recovery, which has made sure that the banks and the insurance companies in this country pay their fair share. Profits in excess of a billion dollars will be subject to additional tax. We are making sure that Canadians can meet the affordability challenge that they're facing, Mr. Speaker. That's our job. We're on it. Well, member for Humber River, Black Creek. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. During the pandemic, gender-based violence increased at an alarming rate. We simultaneously saw that crisis lines were used more than ever across Canada, and this demand unfortunately continues today. Can the Minister for Women and Gender Equality and Youth share what our government is doing to respond to this heartbreaking increase and provide support to those experiencing gender-based violence. Thank you. The Honourable Mem Minister of Women and Gender Equality. Mr. Speaker, thanks to the Honourable Member for her question and for shining a light on this very important issue. Crisis hotlines are a lifeline for women fleeing domestic violence because they provide a connection to safe resources. Our announcement last week of $8 million to support crisis hotlines across Ontario is our ninth agreement with our provincial and territorial counterparts. Bottom line, Mr. Speaker, if someone is experiencing gender-based violence, when they call or text, someone is there 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. The Honourable Member for Calgary Forest Lawn. After eight years of the Civil Prime Minister's failures, home is where the broken heart is. Housing has become more unaffordable, unattainable, and more broken than ever before. The Governor of the Bank of Canada admitted it was Liberals overspending that caused eight consecutive bank interest rate hikes in one year. And now home, homes are unaffordable than ever before. Mortgage costs don't even cover interest payments after eight years of this Liberals' failures. Will the Prime Minister take some responsibility for breaking housing and stop gatekeeping so we can fix everything he broke? Yeah. The Honourable Minister of Housing. I inform the Honourable Member that he just has to look very close to him to see that the biggest gatekeepers are all in his caucus. They vote against every housing measure to remove barriers against more housing supply. They vote against supports to, for first-time home buyers to build more affordable housing, but also to help them access more homes. They, they voted against the Rapid Housing Initiative. They voted against the Co-op Program. They voted against the National Housing Co-Investment Fund. I'm running out of time, Mr. Speaker, but they need to get their act together. The Honourable Member for Calgary Forest Lawn. We will always vote against failed liberal policies that double home costs across this country. And after eight years of their failed policies, rents have doubled, mortgages have doubled, home prices have doubled, and home ownership is nothing but a dream for newcomers. Not, not everyone has a trust fund like this Prime Minister and can absorb all the tax hikes that they keep causing on newcomers and Canadians alike. Will they finally take some responsibility and admit that they've caused this housing crisis and get out of the way so we we can show them how to fix it. The Honourable Minister of Housing, Diversity and Inclusion. Canadians can see through the gimmick on the hot air, and this is the fact. When we brought real measures to help Canadian renters with the, with the cost of rent, they not only voted against it, but they pr played procedural games in this House to delay the passage of that much-needed rental support. In addition to that, we've passed legislation to increase housing supply to uh, help Canadians who are uh, purchasing their first home, and we've put in place measures to make sure that we remove barriers to building more housing supply. In all of those measures, they voted against it. 
The Honourable Member for Peterborough Kawartha. Mr. Speaker, nine out of ten young Canadians have completely given up the hope of ever owning a home. Wow. Wow. Why? Because under this Prime Minister, housing and rental prices have doubled. The average monthly mortgage payment for a Canadian family is three thousand dollars. Wow. Mr. Speaker, this is outrageous. Canadian families are suffering. Food is up 12 per cent. The time for change is long overdue. Will the Prime Minister show some leadership? Step down, take accountability, or get out of the way so we can fix what he has broken. That's a good point. Yeah, yeah. That's a good Minister of Housing. Their party's record on housing is very clear, not only in government, but even in opposition. They haven't taken the time to reflect on the importance of federal leadership and investment in housing. Their caucus has been very clear that they believe the federal government should do less on housing. We on this side of the House believe that we should do more, and we are doing more, Mr. Speaker. Mr. President, I would like to say... Mr. Speaker... Let me tell you what's been happening in Canada since 2015. With eight years of this Prime Minister, average mortgage payments have nearly doubled. After eight years with this Prime Minister, the cost of groceries has gone up by 11.6 percent. In a G7 country, feeding oneself and housing oneself has become extremely difficult. But it's never his fault. When will he admit the harm this is causing Canadians and take responsibility for what he has broken? The Honourable Minister. What do we hear on the other side of this house? Despair. Unhelpful words that won't help Canadians. What you're hearing, that's what you're hearing, but what you're not hearing is a plan. No plan for housing, no plan for climate change, no plan for the economy, no plan for affordability. That is the no plan team, but luckily we're on this side. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister made a rather unexpected statement as the House adjourned for a two-week recess. We all want to close Roxham Road, he said. For years, we've been asking the government to close Roxham, saying that Quebec has exceeded its capacity, it's not safe, it's creating an illegal smuggling industry. And now he tells us we all want to close Roxham Road. So the question is, how is it then that they recently renewed the lease on the surrounding land for 10 years if they really want to close Roxham today. The Honourable Minister for Immigration. I want to thank my colleague for the question. As he knew full well, it's not easy to just close Roxham Road. We need to work with all of our partners, including provinces and the United States. I will continue to work with our partners in the United States and Canada to make sure we uphold our obligations. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister also said that there were no simplistic solutions, and we agree on that. But there's uh, 17 days left before the end of the Conservative leader's ultimatum. We have a simple but not simplistic solution. Suspend the safe third country agreement. There would be no longer any advantage to going through Roxham Road to make an asylum claim which could be made at any regular border crossing. That's the humanitarian thing to do. What's the government waiting for to suspend the safe third country agreement? They could do it today. When are they going to do it? The Honourable Minister for Immigration. Mr. Speaker, we can't just suspend an agreement with the United States. That's not a real solution. It's essential to work with communities throughout our country, we have to continue our work with the United States and provinces. I have a meeting with my counterpart in the province of Quebec, and I will work with that person as well as all stakeholders to find a sustainable solution. General Thousand Islands and Rita Lakes. These Liberals are so determined to have control over the lives of Canadians that they want to control what Canadians are able to see on the internet. Their online censorship bill is a backdoor for the Liberals to silence their critics. Social media executives have said that the measures in this bill are the same used by North Korea, Cuba, and the communist regime in Beijing. When will the Liberals scrap this attack on free speech. The Honourable Minister, Heritage Canada. 
Mr. Speaker, I, I don't think my colleagues understand what he's talking about. If he's talking about C11, it's simply asking streamers to support the king culture. If he's talking about C18, it's simply asking the web giants to support independent journalism, Mr. Speaker. But one thing remains. They keep filibustering things that are absolutely essential for Kenyans. So if they don't want to help us, they should st stay out of the way and let us do the job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Honorable member for Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands, Arena Lakes. While Conservatives are standing up for Canadian creators and helping them to be successful, these Liberals are looking to do everything they can, and I'm sure if we'd let them, they'd freeze Canadians' bank accounts that they disagree with. Oh, wait. They couldn't even pick Canadian content out of a lineup if we circled it for them. But after eight years of this Prime Minister, it's time for a government that protects Canadian Canadians' free speech, it protects Canadian creators' rights. Will they scrap their online censorship bill? Yeah. The Honourable Minister, Canadian Heritage. For Conservatives, culture is what they think that culture is what you find in a yogurt ball, Mr. Speaker. They never raise it. They don't care about it. They stand up Vanilla. for web giants. That's it. The minister can restart his answer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We're here supporting our culture, our artists, our creators, our music industry, our books, our television, our movies. What they're supporting? They're supporting web giants, the tech giants. That's it. They're standing up for them, not for Canadians. On this side, we're standing up for Canadians, Mr. Speaker. And we defend Quebec and the provinces. Last April, the government of Quebec sent a letter to the Minister of Heritage. And what did he do with the letter? He put it in his office. He took his pile of documents and slid it underneath. And for a year, he did nothing. With the complicity of the Bloc Québécois, it was complete radio silence. The Minister of Heritage is an experienced parliamentarian and knows the best way to tackle a file is to bring people together at a parliamentary committee. Will the Minister of Canadian Heritage convince his bloc uh, uh, colleagues to say yes to Quebec's request? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, the government says yes to Quebec and works with Quebec. What Quebec wants is for C-11 to pass for movies and television and music, and the Conservatives have done everything they could to filibuster, and all of a sudden they're getting up to say that culture is important. Since when is it important to them? They don't care about it. We're defending our artists in spite of them. The Honourable, the Honourable Member for Cloverdale, Langley City. Mr. President, I'll come and be Brittany. Mr. Speaker, in British Columbia and across the country, the demand among young people to learn French keeps growing. Last week, to launch the Mois de la Francophonie, I was able to visit an immersion class with the Minister of Official Languages. Can she tell this House how she supports French language learning in our province? The Honourable Minister for Official Languages. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank my colleague for Langley City for his work. I was pleased to go to Vancouver, where we announced a federal investment of nearly $6.8 million to support a series of projects to recruit, train, and retain more Francophone teachers. The federal government will always be there to support our Francophone communities throughout the country. Thank you. Opposition. The Prime Minister said this week that he was surprised that his own health department granted a permit to a company to get into the cocaine business. I don't know why he would be surprised. His own addictions minister put out a, 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 an ordinance on January 30th allowing for cocaine, crack, heroin, and other deadly drugs to be possessed and used in British Columbia. This is the obvious consequence of his decisions. Why don't he, why doesn't he reverse his decision and ban cocaine and other deadly drugs? Yeah. 
The Honorable Minister. The Honorable Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Mr. Speaker, there are very strict rules in place for obtaining and maintaining a controlled substance license in Canada. These order, order, order. 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 The Honourable Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. These licenses by Health Canada for controlled substances are for scientific and medical purposes only. Companies cannot sell products to the general public. Health Canada has contacted the companies holding a license to reiterate the very narrow parameters of their license and ask to retract any misleading statements. If the strict requirements are not being followed, Health Canada will not hesitate in revoking the licenses. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. The misleading statements are coming from this government, which actually decriminalized cocaine, crack, heroin, and other deadly drugs. You can forgive the company for believing that when it got a permit to do, get into the cocaine business, that that's exactly what it meant. In fact, the company got the permit for cocaine in two months, so it's faster to get a cocaine permit than a passport in Canada under this Prime Minister. Why don't we bring back some common sense, ban cocaine and other dangerous drugs to protect our people? The Honourable Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Mr. Speaker, the member knows full well Health Canada acted swiftly and has issued regulatory letters to Ad Astra Labs and Sunshine Earth Labs regarding the misinformation they published. Health Canada spoke to both companies and requested immediate action to retract and clarify their statements. Both Ad Astra Labs and Sunshine Earth Labs issued a retraction and updated their press release. Health Canada issued a bulletin to all licensed dealers across the country clarifying their responsibilities and authorities under their license. The Honourable Member for Perth Wellington. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Chair of the Standing Committee on Procedure and House Affairs. The committee has charged the Chair to table before this House a report calling on the government to launch an inquiry into foreign interference in Canadian elections, while also maintaining the committee's agenda and schedule of meetings into these serious allegations. Will the Chair of the Procedure and House Affairs Committee do the right thing and rise in this House today after question period and table the committee's report? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Government House Leader. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. As is the case with, uh, with all committees, a committee report uh, will be given the opportunity to uh, be tabled. Order. Can you ask yourself your own question? Let me, let me talk to the people at the table for just one moment, and then we'll come back. Order. After consulting with the table, you can't answer your own question. So, the first person to stand up gets the opportunity to answer that question, the, honor the Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and, uh, and I appreciate the opportunity to stand, and, uh, and I appreciate the enthusiasm for hearing me uh, speak. Uh, but, Mr. Speaker, uh, as is always the case, uh, when committees bring forward reports, of course, in due, to, in due course, they will appear before this House, and there will be an opportunity for this chamber to deliberate on those reports. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Newmarket Aurora. Mr. Speaker. Last week, the York Region Liberal Caucus announced a $19 million investment in YorkNet through the Universal Broadband Fund. This funding will improve broadband capacity for over 3,800 underserved households in the York Region, closing 99% of the underserved gap. Can the Minister of Rural Economic Development please update this House on the work our government is doing to make sure that all Canadians have access to reliable, high-speed internet. The Honourable Minister of Rural Economic Development. 
Speaker, and thanks to my colleague from Newmarket Aurora for his question and his dedication to rural Ontarians. And it is great news for the people of the York Region, for small business, big business, not for profits, and frankly, good news for everyone, because we know that having access to reliable, high-speed internet is the economic equalizer to open up countless opportunities. Since 2015, we have on the table over $7 billion for connectivity. We have connected over a quarter of a million households, but we're not stopping, Mr. Speaker. By 2026, 98% of Canadians will be connected, and by 2030, 100% of Canadians will have access to internet. The Honourable Member for Nanaimo Lady Smith. Mr. Speaker, open net fish farms pollute our waters and harm wild Pacific salmon. The health of wild salmon is critical. First Nation chiefs across British Columbia have been calling on the Prime Minister to get these harmful fish farms out of our waters, but he's refusing to meet them. Well, he's in luck. For BC First Nations are currently in Ottawa advocating to protect wild Pacific salmon. Will the Prime Minister meet with these First Nations and commit to get these fish farms out of the water with a plan for all those impacted? The Honourable Minister of the uh, D Department of Fisheries and Oceans. Mr. Speaker, and I'm, I'm happy to say that I met with the delegation this morning and we have plans to continue working together so that we can include all of the First Nations affected by open net pen aquaculture as we transition away over the coming years. Mr. Speaker, we're in the final stretch of analyzing Bill C-13 to modernize both official languages. Tomorrow, in committee, we'll address amendments that deal with the issue of language clauses or linguistic clauses to ensure that francophones in minority situations actually receive the money invested by the federal government when there's an agreement between the federal government and the provinces and territories. These clauses would finally ensure equity for all francophones in the country. All francophone advocacy groups agree with it. Can the Minister clearly tell us whether she agrees with such clauses. The Honourable Minister for Official Languages. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank my colleague for his important question. As he said it so well, Bill C-13 is currently before Parliamentary Committee, where clause-by-clause -clause study is ongoing. This bill would allow official language minority communities to get what they've been waiting for for so long. I'm really looking forward to having it passed. I hope the committee will conclude its work quickly because communities and stakeholders from all over the country want to see it pass as quickly as possible. Time for question period today. It being 313, pursuant to order made on Thursday, June 23rd, 2022, the House will now proceed to the taking of the deferred recorded division on the motion of Mr. Davies relating to business of supply. Call in the members.